Okay, so the complex portal uh, has been presented now at uh, many of the bi-curation com uh, conferences, so I'm not going to waste too much time uh, talking about it, uh, or the background to it. It's a freely available resource, uh, and our idea was to, bring, to create reference entities for complexes in the same way that Uniprot does for proteins, Kebi for small molecules, so that we can pull together all the information about these macromolecular assemblies that's scattered across numerous uh, resources. So you all have a common identifier, a stable identifier, that can be used to uh, bring this information together. Uh, so the definition of a complex is a stable uh, entity that you can purify and has a function associated with it. So it's not just a co-IP or a yeast to hybrid. It's a functional entity. Uh, made up of proteins, but also potentially of small molecules, so cofactors, for instance, uh, RNAs, ribozymes, uh, a nice example of that, um, and indeed anything, uh, you know, glycans, anything else that could be uh, a, a, part, a stable part of this entity. Uh, our identifiers are versions, so if we get it wrong, we've uh, missed a component or we've got carried away and added a, too many components, uh, then we can uh, release a new version with a, a, a updated identifier. And as I say, they're increasingly being used across multiple resources to bring all this information together. So we've got, actually got data on 28 species. I'm just going to concentrate on four for the benefit of this talk uh, as examples of what we do. Um, so obviously human is uh, the organism that most people are interested in. So we're slowly working our way through the human complexism, to use yet another buzzword. Um, and uh, the release we're just currently working on at the moment, we'll have uh, 1,700 manually curated complexes uh, going public. How many we expect to have in the long term is a interesting question. I'm guessing there's going to be about four to six hundred, uh, four to six thousand, sorry, uh, functional assemblies um, that uh, we can confidently say are, are pro uh, stable protein complexes. And we have a collaboration working with um, two or three groups, machine learning groups and, and proteomics groups, uh, to help produce uh, HUMAP3. HUMAP1 and 2 are uh, derived complex is predicted to exist in large-scale proteomics data set. QMAP3 will be the same, but with uh, our input, we'll have a lot more confidence on which of those are real complexes in uh, our terms, and which are degradation products, partial assemblies, or complexes with other proteins transiently stuck to them. But we have been working on other species, so we started off in E. coli and yeast, Partly because that sort of gave us a baseline, a beginning point, where once we got uh, those uh, complexosomes, I'm not going to say completely finished, but we've got a first draft done, so we think we've got most of the complexes identified and curated. We're certainly only finding new ones in sort of one or two every few months. Um, so we know for E. coli there are just over 300 uh, complexes, and for Saccharomyces cerevisiae just over 600. We're currently working with Flybase uh, to uh, collect together the Drosophila complexes as well. Um, we've got 200, uh, the, well, we will have 200 as soon as this current release goes public. Um, and uh, we've uh, still got a long to-do list. Again, I'm guessing, but I'm thinking probably about 1,500 functional assemblies. Uh, it's a smaller uh, proteome than humans, so we won't expect those sorts of numbers. Uh, and they say collaboration can be as simple as, a, or is as simple as a Google spreadsheet. So those of you who are working either on particular model organisms or in an area of biology and you're generating these complexes, you're reading those papers, if you just contact me or someone at the, else at the uh, EBI, uh, uh, complex portal uh, and we'll set up a sort of shared area where you can just dump in the list of accession numbers, a name, some pay, uh, PubMed IDs, and we'll turn it into a complex portal entry and add all the additional cross-references, so crystal data, um, is it in reactome, if it's human, is it associated with a disease, that sort of uh, thing, uh, and we'll generate the stable accession number for you, and immediately you've got a link, it'll link into Uniprot, we're cross-referencing already, we're going to be importing more data in the foreseeable future. Um, 
So that's my sort of pitch for please share your annotation efforts. So I'll just spend the last couple of minutes running through what sort of things we're already starting to see. So first of all, comp uh, complexes as a whole get bigger as you move up the evolutionary scale, but that's not always true. So proteins do go missing. So the MIS-12 complex, which is part of the kinetochore, conserved across all the eukaryotes, uh, but a protein mysteriously goes missing in the fly. And interesting, it's, uh, if you look at the yeast data, they'll tell you it's an absolute uh, uh, essential protein. Knock it out in yeast, you kill the yeast. In fly, it seems to disappear quite happily. Uh, so interesting, I'm not going to give you the answers, tell you why that's the case, but uh, it's think that observations like that are interesting, and they're interesting to ev evolutional biologists, and also to those of us who work in resources like Uniprot, who are trying to understand protein function. Uh, we're starting to see isoform-specific entities, uh, so the cyclin L1 CDK11 complex in human has two very, very diff involved in two processes. So obviously, uh, cyclin-dependent serine threonine and protein kinases, but it, depending on which isoform uh, is uh, attached to the, uh, the kinase isoform is present, uh, you're, it's involved in two totally different uh, processes. And we're also now increasingly seeing, both in human and in fly, uh, tissue-specific va uh, va complex variants. Uh, so the uh, mitochondrial py pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, nice example. Uh, and uh, so in the, uh, globally, you find a pH, sorry, my eyesight's not that great, PDHA1 uh, component, but in the test, uh, test is, yes, in the test is, you very specifically see uh, the A2. That data's borne out both with RNA-seq data, so this is um, from uh, Array Express, or Atlas, rather, uh, and uh, also from uh, Proteome HD, where they're looking at protein levels uh, using SILAT labeling. Again, exactly the same picture. Uh, the two components, one uh, seen in the testes, the other one uh, expressed far more globally, but not in the testes. So an absolute requirement there. And interestingly, as uh, testes in general, this seems to be where at the moment we're picking up most of these isoform-specific uh, entities, both in human and in fly. Okay, so in summary, um, first of all, I'm doing a pitch for please contribute your complexes. Um, and this help, helps us to uh, identify the variants, looking at perologous proteins, uh, isoform specific functionality, tissue specificity. It gives us information about the uh, evolution of the complex, so that's looking both at variants of the complex within the species, but in, interestingly across the species as well. And uh, please add information content. I thought I'd updated this slide. It's obviously reverted to an old version uh, where I didn't have that embarrassing typo in the last line um, with species-specific uh, complexes. So thank you. And if I have time, any questions? Thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. I thought this was a new acronym here, so... <laughs> no, just a typo. Uh, <laughs> any question? Yes. Hi, nice presentation, Sandra. I, I was wondering, since you had the example of the cyclin CDK complex, if there is any, if at any point in time you would be also considering the CDK inhibitor, which is sometimes bound to it, but it's transient. But yeah, um, where do you draw the draw the boundaries? And are there any plans for the future to also include the less stable components? Yeah. So the uh, well, obviously everything is uh, linked to ontologies, as you expect. Um, one of the uh, we have got ontological terms that would allow us to differentiate between a totally stable concept a co uh, complex and a transient complex. So the mechanisms there, first of all. We focus first on stable complexes because they're relatively straightforward and it was an achievable target. If we start moving into the world of signal transduction, we're opening an yet another can of worms. Um, so it's there for the future, but at the moment, not something we're tackling. How tra the, but then, of course, you'll get that, where do you draw the line? What's a stable complex? What's a transient complex? How long does something have to exist for? Um, and that, at the end of the day, is a bio-curation call. That's what we're here for. That's what we're paid to do, to make these sorts of calls. And that's why you need professional curators. And I'm not going to say we're going to get it right every time, but uh, that's our job, is to make those decisions. 
This is great. So this was basically, this could have been now the, the last word of the, conf of the conference. Right? So this is, yeah, your call. I want more than seven minutes, minutes <laughs> if I'm going to be the closing <laughs> argument. <laughs> okay. okay, but the conference will still go on. And the next thing we have to do again, thanks, Sarah.